Hello, this is Hope Matters, a production of Mount Olive Lutheran Church here in Santa Monica, California. I'm Pastor Eric Schaefer, the senior pastor here at Mount Olive. And each week we bring you an interesting uh, person from around the USA and or around the community or even around the world to talk about the theme of hope because we believe that hope matters. My guest this week is my friend, Bishop Kevin Strickland, who is Bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America's Southeastern Synod, where he's been Bishop for about two years. And before that, uh, Bishop Strickland served as Executive Assistant to our ELCA Presiding Bishop and Director for Worship. And before that, Kevin, I saw that you served in numerous congregations in, in what is your new, is your mostly in your territory now as Bishop. So welcome. Thank you for joining us today on Hope Matters. Yeah, thanks. It's nice to be with you in, uh, across 3,000 miles. I'm glad technology allows us that. Uh, that's hopeful in and of itself. Um, so, yeah, I served uh, two congregations in Tennessee prior to being um, asked to serve as the assistant to the presiding bishop and executive for worship. I was there at Churchwide for five years and then elected June of 2019 as bishop of the Southeastern Synod. And tell our viewers who aren't familiar with ELCA geography, what does the Southeastern Synod en encompass? Yeah, so it's uh, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, and Tennessee. So all four of those states. And uh, we, uh, our offices are in Atlanta. I live in Atlanta, uh, but we have congregations spread about all four of those states, uh, about 160 congregations, uh, about eight campus ministry settings. Um, and then we have folks who serve in hospitals and prison chaplaincies across the four states as well. That's interesting geography in 2021. It's, it's kind of a combination of the old and new South, isn't it? Yeah, it was, well, it, part of the Synod was LCA, and then there was a smattering of the Synod that was ALC in the 60s. And then when the ELCA was formed, obviously it became the four uh, states. But um, yeah, I mean, primarily most of our congregations are in Georgia. Um, and then our largest, second largest chunk is in uh, Tennessee. Uh, we actually have uh, our oldest congregation in the Synod is 300 years old, and it's in uh, Rankin, Georgia. Uh, but we have congregations in East Tennessee and the uh, mountain areas that range anywhere between 200 and 250 years old. Wow. Wow. So that's just, yes, that's a, the uh, Savannah area is the historic Lutheran area in Georgia, isn't it? The, the, as I remember. Yeah. And uh, uh, Salzburgers. is. Uh, they settled there 300 years ago, and we uh, have a congregation there. It's the oldest continuous church building in the state of Georgia. Wow, that's that's yeah. interesting. And then, of course, you have some new new starts. So you have the you have the other yeah. extreme, brand new missions in in uh, in probably in mostly in the Atlanta area, I would guess. Yeah, well, we have one new start we created in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, called the Table. And it's specifically a ministry that reaches out to unchurched, dechurched, hurt by the church people, uh, specifically in the LGBTQA community. And uh, that's pastored by one of our mission developers, Pastor Don Bennett. Uh, and it's located on 8th Avenue in uh, downtown Nashville. Wow, cool. You were, when you were elected, only the second ELCA bishop who was, who was uh, you know, homosexual, gay, and, you know, the election may have seemed surprising to some people because it was in the South. How's it going? Yeah, I mean, so I was the second elected openly uh, gay bishop in the church. Um, Guy Irwin was the first. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was surprised to be elected in general just because I wasn't, um, you know, gunning for this, wanting this necessarily. Um, I had a call. I was had a very busy call. I had a national call, so I was not bored. Um, but I was asked by many people to discern this call as bishop, and I did. Um, I allowed my name to go forward. And uh, honestly, all I really wanted out of the process was a chance to speak. And I thought if I could speak, uh, I really just want to be able to share uh, my faith story and uh, my hope for the Synod for the next six years. Uh, whether I was bishop or not. And I got that opportunity. And after I sat down, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> um, and so when I was elected, I was, I was rather shocked. Um, and I, would, I was shocked just in general. I wasn't shocked by any uh, demographic place. I was just shocked. Um, 
and I, I was surprised that an openly gay person who happens to be gay and happens to be a pastor in this church was elected bishop. Uh, but I was also proud of the synod because the final two candidates for bishop were myself and an African American female. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, so it's been it's been going okay. I mean, I suffer no fools to know that not everybody is okay with uh, my personhood. But uh, the way I try to present myself is with the integrity of um, I am uh, no different than any other person when it comes to the fact that our commonality is as humans. Uh, our shared relationship is as children of God, um, and I happen to be a child of God who just happens to be gay, uh, and that's not, you know, it's it's not my uh, my only um, uh, personhood. So it's been going okay. I mean, it's you know we have congregations that I know have struggled with that. We have people who have struggled with that, um, but as I tell people who are struggling with it, I said, you know, I struggled with it my entire life. Uh, and lived in a church to where um, I was not welcome to be my full self for many, many years. Um, and so where they're struggling with it now, I just, I always, I start with the commonality. Um, we have a shared struggle in that. Um, so when they're saying, I'm struggling with you, it's like, well, I've been struggling with me uh, my whole life. So at least we have something in common, you know, and uh, then I think we get down to what we share, which is that uh, we're all created, I believe, in the image of God, no less and no more. And uh, when God creates us, God says to each person, uh, you are intrinsically made in my image. And I think if the church uh, can can uplift, uphold that, uh, I really do think that could be a, a bright spot for us to continue to lean into. Wonderful, thank you for that. Well, knowing you a bit, I suspect, you know, I, I, when I saw the election, I thought, well, if, if, if Bishop Strickland can get can get into conversation with people, he can change hearts and minds. You know, and I, you know, I, I know that's one of your skills. So I'm, it's, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for you, my friend, that you're there and doing this work. So, what are some of the biggest challenges being a bishop in this four state area that has many many differences and well as well some similarities? What have you found out in the two years? Um, yeah, it has, it has challenges. You know, one of the biggest challenges is just the geography. I mean, but I said during the election process that I wanted to use technology more to bring us together. Little did I know <laughs> six months after that, that would all come true. Right, uh, right. Have to be. <laughs> but, you know, honestly, uh, that's been a gift. I mean, um, connecting with people who otherwise either A, wouldn't have shown up because of distance, uh, or B, I couldn't have gotten to because of time, uh, connecting through Zoom and uh, using Facebook and YouTube and our website. I mean, those have all been really helpful ministry tools um, these past two years. And I think I've actually had more FaceTime with people in, in individual connection than I otherwise would have had. Uh, and so that's actually been a gift amidst the challenge. I think the other challenge is, and we're no different, regardless of how spread out we are. I think this is true of, of the whole church. Um, denominations in general and congregations more specifically, I think are all going through a reformation. Uh, they're all asking the question of um, where are we? Where are we going? How are we going to get there? And how are we going to afford to do it? That's right. Uh, where I think the questions are mis, mis uh, aligned, and this is where the challenge comes, is when people say, uh, you know, um, how do we remain relevant? Um, personally, I think relevancy is really overrated uh, because uh, we are relevant. Uh, we, the church, is relevant when we make God the center of the action. That in and of itself, and we point people to the cross, which the story doesn't end there, and then to the empty tomb where, where our hope rests. I mean, the relevancy of that is, for me, a uh, uh, <laughs> that that is a relevancy and some people say oh my challenge is the church is shrinking there's not enough youth and you know how do we stay creative and innovative and relevant it's like the message of jesus christ god's son by the power of the holy spirit that still comes alive and active in this world amidst the pandemic of covid19 and racism and the care of our creation and so many more the relevancy of it is is that the church the christian witness 
stands in the midst of that and says, God is not dead. God is still present. And that we believe in a God who will see us even through this time. And so the challenges I hear are, are those questions of relevancy, aging clergy, um, congregations that have dwindled in size. And this is pre-pandemic, but I think the pandemic has only sped up these conversations. Um, and then I see people struggling with what does it mean to be the church in a world that seems to have changed faster than the church has? Uh, and so I'd, we've been trying to address some of those challenges um, and to, to keep what is central central. Um, and it's a struggle, but at the same time, I mean, there's joy to be had in the struggle. Uh, and people are tired, exhausted, and, and yet amidst that tired and exhaustion, I mean, God is still very present in, in our ministries. Um, and I think my role amidst those challenges has been to point people to that. Um, and I, I hope I have. I hope I have. I really do. I, and I think for the most part as a synod, we have become more concrete, more emblazoned, more bold um, in our witness. And I'm really proud of that. But those challenges we're encountering are really no different than any other place. Um, the geography, it does make it more difficult. Um, and I have been traveling more recently than I was for the past 18 months. Um, and that has added to the calendar. But uh, I continue to do the Zooms and lots of phone calls while I'm in my car. That's that's lovely. Well, you know, you kind of hinted at that. So the, the theme of these, these brief interviews is hope. So what does bring you hope, Bishop, in 2021? Hmm. One of the verses that I've been using recently um, is uh, from 2 Corinthians, you know, so that we do not lose heart. Uh, even though that our outer nature is wasting away, our inward nature is ever turning towards uh, God's glory. Um, it's easy to lose heart, which is easy to lose hope. Uh, but what's really bringing me hope these days is when I see the fortitude, the resiliency, uh, the, the kind of almost that bootstrap mentality of like, you know, this isn't going to get us down. Um, I have seen people really heed a call to action in the midst of, of this pandemic. Um, I mean, we have one pastor who they don't have Wi-Fi in their area. They don't, and most of their people don't have computers and very wow. few of them even have cell phones. And so she got in her car and just went literally door to door to offer pastoral care, to preach in the yard. Uh, and then these rural people were feeding people throughout this whole pandemic. Uh, that's hopeful. That's hopeful. You know, and even our large congregations have been able to continue with uh, homeless ministry in the midst of all this. That's hopeful. What's also more hopeful for me, though, is that the gospel has been preached week in and week out regardless. Uh, and man, that brings me a lot of hope. I mean, it really does. And the other place I find great hope is in our children, uh, not because they are the future, because they are the ever-present movement of the church. Um, and where I find great hope in them is if you want to take a break from the seriousness and the stress of the world, go sit with a four or five-year-old and just ask them how their day is. And that is one of my greatest joys when I go into congregation is to, is to talk to our children uh, because they're just the blunt honesty and yet the joy that they exude. I wish we all had that because the hope the hope they have for the church, for the world, and for one another uh, is contagious. Um, and so that's where I find a lot of hope these days is, is in the resiliency of people, the faithfulness of the gospel being preached, and, and in the faces of our children. That's wonderful. Thank you, Bishop. I appreciate this. This has been Hope Matters, a production of Mount Olive Lutheran Church in Santa Monica, California. Our guest this week has been Bishop Kevin Strickland, who is Bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America's Southeastern Synod and, uh, and former worship director of the ELCA, parish pastor, and uh, just uh, just been wonderful to talk with you today, Kevin. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. Join us again next week when we will have a new guest on Hope Matters. Every Wednesday, we bring you a new guest on Hope Matters. We talk about hope because we believe that hope matters, and we believe in a God of hope.